Mr. President and your honors, I am Nguyen Chia. I would like to make some statement in response to the key documents presented by the co-prosecutors on the 24th through the 27th of June 2013. Your Honours, during the past few days, commencing from the 24th to the 27th of June, from my holding cell downstairs, I attentively paid attention to the presentation of several documents by both the national and international co-prosecutors. Though I sometimes got what the prosecution submitted, there were times that I could not follow what uh, being discussed due to my poor health conditions. Nonetheless, I understood enough to believe that what were raised by the prosecution appeared to be neither accurate nor corresponding to the actual events that had happened during that period. I would therefore like to grave your honor's indulgence, for I wish to enlighten the court on these matters. With that, uh, I would like to contest the entirety of the content and the form of documents presented by the prosecution as follows. First of all, I'd like to address the issue of A. Evacuation of the people. A few years ago, I already testified that after the liberation day of the 17th of April 1975, all city dwellers were evacuated. And it is obvious. In any event, the evacuation was not forced. The leadership had to make such decision based on two main reasons. First, it was fear that Americans would drop bombs on cities after Lonor's government was defunct. This made the leadership believe that the aerial bombardments would be carried out again onto the cities, especially the city of Phnom Penh. Your Honours, it is well known that the Americans supported Lonol's regime and South Vietnam, while North Vietnam was in support of the Democratic Kampuchea against South Vietnam and the Americans. As a consequence, the Americans believed that North Vietnam and the Democratic Cambodia were its enemies. For a period of 300 nights and days, the Americans had dropped 
several million tons of bombs onto Cambodia. The, de the destruction caused by the bombings was of mind-boggling scale, when properties, homes, pagodas, cattle were hit, and several thousand of innocent lives were killed. Noting this unfortunate tragedy, which would most likely happen again, and to ensure safety and security for the people, the leadership of the Democratic Kampuchea, Pol Pot in particular, decided to evacuate people from the cities. Second of all, Cambodia had gone through war for over five years already. This made the country face several challenges, including food shortages. Food shortages were the primary concern to be addressed very urgently. At that time, Cambodia did not receive any aid or assistance from foreign countries. In the light of this dire circumstance, people were required to take part in rice production by themselves to support their livelihood and to build the country. In spite of the above-mentioned reasons, the evacuation of the people at that time was done on a voluntary basis, without any coercive measures, violence, or killing of the people. To maintain this principle, people were educated and well explained about the danger of the Americans' aerial bombardments on cities and the need to resolve food shortages for the livelihood of the people and for building the country ourselves. At that time, people appreciated the danger the country faced and its need. In particular, people supported and loved the revolution. Eventually, people gradually had left the cities after they had received our appeal and explanation to do so. Your Honours, I would wish to bring to your attention some documents that are improper and that cannot be used as the basis for the Chamber's consideration in its ruling to find justice for me and the victims. These documents include, first, the revolutionary flags. The co-prosecutors submitted based on some information regarding the revolutionary flags as the inculpatory evidence against me. Factually, the revolutionary flags had nothing to do with me. The reason I say so because the revolutionary flags were the medical messages, rather the political messages by the senior leaders of the regime. These magazines were not legal documents that had to be applied. Before the victory on the 17th of April 1975, as well as the aftermath of that liberation, that message, the political message in the magazines were very important to gather the forces of the Democratic Kampuchea because Cambodia during that period of time, indeed after the internal war was over, there were uh, wars in which neighboring country, including Vietnam, invaded Cambodia. 
Vietnam never wanted Cambodia to be in to be in peace. They used or uh, employed all dirty tricks and tactics uh, to topple Cambodia. For that reason, Pol Pot had to release me political messages in the magazines to show the people that uh, the leadership was still strong, firm, and that uh, most of the time the information is not accurate. If we look carefully into the content of the revolutionary flag magazines, we can note that the majority of the articles published in these newspapers or magazines were mainly the statements by Pol Pot and the report collected from each sector or zone across the country. This has already been confirmed in the references the co-prosecutors refer to in the hearings uh, from the 24th uh, to the 27th of June 2013. As a principle, the revolutionary flag magazines uh, were examined uh, by the standing of uh, the Central Committee. Nonetheless, it was Pol Pot alone who made all the decisions before any articles could be published. So, all in all, the decision was made not by collective but by Pol Pot. He himself had his own personal assistant who was fully in charge of writing the articles and publication of these magazines. I still remember that uh, there is another person by the name of Gum Wun, alias Chaum, who worked uh, in this group. At that time, even though the members of the Central Committee uh, didn't see uh, the right thing being said, no one would dare to challenge uh, such a decision. Pol Pot had all the power, absolute power. Whatever he said, he meant business. In the socialist uh, regime, the people who had all the most power had the decision on the fate of the country, and it was only one person who was behind all the decisions. It was the secretary of the party. Your Honours, I am interested in the accuracy of the documents being put by the co-prosecutor regarding uh, this document, including the revolutionary flags. And the main point that I wish to uh, draw your attention to is the original documents that the prosecutor uh, put before the chamber. On this point, I already made my submission time and again from the very beginning that uh, documents of original source had to be uh, placed before the chamber or showed to me, but all to no avail. I don't understand much about the rule of evidence, but I fully understand what justice is. So far, the core prosecutors presented some documents which were mainly inculpatory documents and they were the copied versions. I believe it is not fair for me uh, to be presented such uh, copied documents because after all, no one n knows uh, whether these documents are genuine or they were the fake ones. On top of that, if the chamber allows such documents to be examined, there were chances uh, that the document could be fabricated or changed easily and justice will be compromised and the truth will never be found. So, I would like to 
absolutely take issue with all the documents presented by the co-prosecutors against me. Secondly, the citation of documents from books. According to or in these proceedings, I have also noted that several articles from books were quoted by the co-prosecutors against me. These books include uh, the books from Mr. Philip Short, Mr. David Chandler, Mr. Pongcho Francois, and uh, Mr. Ben Cannon, etc. When it comes to this point, I feel I am stunned and I don't understand why the co-prosecutors resort to using such documents as the core documents against me. Factually, these books, although there are pieces of document inside, um, they, are, they are not 100% true. The quality of truth in that is questionable. In general, in order to make sure the books can be can convince the readers, the authors had to apply some of their methodology and techniques in making sure that people want to read their books. With that, the truth is compromised. I believe that these hearings before us is not part of a theater, it's not a play, so we need to have all the reasons, genuine reasons, to be examined and to be used for the consideration of the final uh, decision in the case. Above all else, if we look more deeply into this aspect, uh, the information gathered by all the authors in their books, uh, these pieces of information were collected from interviews uh, uh, with individuals the authors believed uh, could provide important information to them. To that effect, who can assure or can guarantee that whatever that individual says in the interview is true, others and the reporters are not different. They cannot claim whether the information they obtain through interviews are, um, is 100% uh, true. They can only say that uh, they have obtained these uh, pieces of information from A or from B. That's all. Other than that, they would not be able to comment further. And if we would like to know more about uh, uh, this, uh, we have to really meet those individuals personally to obtain further information or to verify the content of the information. Nonetheless, they, there are still some shortages. So, uh, it is really important that Witnesses that appear before the chamber had to take the oath before he or she is examined. Otherwise, the inf information from them would not bear any property value before the chamber and, none, uh, and after all cannot be used. Also, r authors uh, of the books are foreigners. They don't speak my. So the information they obtained is uh, gathered through the interpreters. Therefore, uh, it lacks integrity and truth. In conclusion, the information obtained uh, from interviews is nothing short of the hearsay pieces of information or evidence. And as it says in Khmer, there is a folk tale about one from one crow to ten crows. And this is the same when you hear a piece of information from one person, this information can be exaggerated to 
uh, 10 times bigger than the original information. And the Khmer folk tale is, in, is meant to educate people not to believe in hearsay uh, pieces of evidence. And it has been here in Cambodian society for all along. And if the chamber were to rely heavily on the hearsay pieces of evidence, I'm convinced that this court would not be able to find proper justice for every one of us. I therefore would like to reject and would like the chamber to reject all the evidence that is quoted from those books as I cited. Third, minutes of the meetings and the documents that I was forwarded. Regarding this, the co-prosecutors also refer to these documents against me. And the references uh, mainly refer to my presence in meetings or the document sometime entitled Copy to Angkor Chia or Nguyen Chia. On this, I wish to also make observation that uh, I do not remember how many times I attended a meeting where Pol Pot attended during the time when I had worked with him. I feel, however, that some information is not true or is still questionable. Nonetheless, even though I attended any of the meetings, that doesn't mean that I engaged in decision-making. There were several meetings that other people attended, but it was not necessary that they had to make any decision. And most of the time, attendees did not challenge a decision made in the meeting. With that, the co-prosecutors cannot conclude that uh, because I was present in the meeting, I also engaged in decision-making. Likewise, there were other documents entitled uh, in which I was copied. That means I did not attend such meetings or engage in any of the decision-making, although I was copied, uh, sometimes I did not receive uh, such uh, documents. Although I may know about them, I had no authority to do anything about this. I had no authority to stop people from implementing the decision. I therefore would like to contest any attempt uh, to bring these pieces of evidence against me. B. The supervisory role and my role. Once again, I would like uh, to make it clear that during the Democratic Cambodia, I was holding three roles in particular. First, Deputy Secretary of the Democratic Cambodia. In this position, I was tasked uh, with um, the roles of propagating and educate people about the policy among the members of the party. At that time, there were not many member parties. With regard to the content of the education session, I never educated uh, members of the party to be bad people or to be misconduct, uh, to behave improperly, for example. I educated only to people to love the nation and country and others. Uh, I never educated any member of the party to kill, mistreat, style, or to commit an act of genocide. Even once, I never did that. Factually, I already mentioned that in this, the sessions, I educated people on how to strengthen security and safety against the enemy. 
I think it is not uncommon because the leadership at all country in the world would have to bear this responsibility to ensure that the country is well protected and security is well preserved for its own people. For example, recently, America has announced that it is hunting uh, Edward Snowden and they would like to send this person for prosecution uh, as he is accused of um, violating the security matters of uh, America. Second, the deputy chairman of the committee to negotiate uh, with the Labour Party of Vietnam. In this role, I did my best uh, to coordinate, negotiate with Vietnam to in to strengthen our relationship and peace with this neighboring country. But uh, it was not successful because Vietnam really would like uh, to wage war and invade Cambodia. Three, I was the president of the People Representative Assembly of Cambodia. As you know, that uh, during the democratic Cambodia, like in the other communist country, the party leads the country, but the state uh, was in full control of the state. And at that time, the institutions uh, or the management of the state was uh, seen in clear division of power. First, uh, the executive body, legislative body, and the judiciary. Paul Pot was in charge of the executive body when I myself was in charge of the president of the People's uh, Representative Assembly. And in this role, I was in charge of uh, making sure that the laws uh, was passed. And also, since Cambodia were has just recovered from war-torn phenomenon um, with Vietnam in particular, we did not have enough time to adopt any new laws. Regarding another role, I did never perform that role. I would like to take issue with the assertion that I used to be the deputy the acting prime minister rather or the person in charge of military committee or I was involved with the supervision of S21 because I was implicated. Please be informed that Paul Pot was the deputy prime minister Rather, Pol Pot had his deputy prime minister, who was Mr. Ying Sari, Son Sen, and Won Wait. So, there was no reason that Pol Pot would like to appoint me as the acting prime minister, apart from the deputy prime minister that I just mentioned. And it is true that he would not do that uh, when he was absent. I would like to also solemnly declare that I engaged in the Democratic Cambodia for the purpose of liberating Cambodia and protect Cambodia from being invaded by the neighboring country. We know that this neighboring country would like to swallow Cambodia all along. I love my own people and I have no reason to mistreat or commit any crime of genocide against my own people. Finally, I would like uh, the court uh, to kindly consider my request uh, regarding my rejection of all the documents uh, presented by the co-prosecutors and it is really important for the purpose of the truth and justice for me. Thank you very much, Mr. President and Your Honours.